from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Welcome once again to our continuing series entitled An Affair with the Arts and Humanities. As I've been saying for the past several weeks, uh, we're most fortunate to have had at North Idaho College the 25th anniversary of the North Idaho College Popcorn Forum, uh, and that was the topic for this year. While those distinguished artists and uh, humanists were on our campus, we have had the opportunity to do television programs with them. In program number five today, we're so pleased to have a very distinguished artist. We welcome to the program Marilyn Lashier, who has a very distinguished background. Uh, she has given workshops and lectures throughout the United States, as well as in other countries, such as Australia, Canada, Denmark, and Kenya. She is a distinguished artist, as I indicated, and she holds a master's degree in fine arts from Washington State University. Her work has appeared around the world. She primarily uses clay, but other materials, such as wood, plaster, lights, and metal, are brought into many of her works. Her art often has a serial quality, and what I uh, was uh, most uh, impressed with is the size of her work. Her work usually focuses on very complex, large-scale ceramic uh, sculptures. Uh, she has won a number of uh, selected awards, including the Sudden Opportunity Award from the Idaho Commission on the Arts. Uh, Marilyn, uh, your work is so impressive, and our viewers are going to be happy to know this. We go through the questions. We oh, have three examples of your work that we will show today. Welcome to North Idaho College and thank you for uh, sharing with us your great talent. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm enjoying it so far. And as always, I'm pleased to have our two regular panel members. First of all is Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho. And next to her is Steve Schink, who is the Dean of College Relations and Development at North Idaho College. And I'm going to pause once again to say to Steve Schink that his staff has been absolutely remarkable. Uh, you have an incredibly gifted staff, and there is uh, no telling how much time that you've put in to make this week special. And then you and Janelle, thanking both of you uh, for doing a, a, a really six-week series in uh, one week. You both uh, are deeply pleasure. appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I shall ask Janelle to commence the questioning. Marilyn, welcome to the show, and we're anxious to get right into some of your work because uh, w when we were talking before the program, it was very, very interesting. Uh, so, can you explain to our viewers in a little bit more depth what kinds of things you do? Because, as Tony mentioned, they're sizable. Uh, they use a particular kind of they're a particular kind of medium, sculpture. Uh, can you tell us something about that? I can start with uh, telling you that I use clay primarily, and I also use my life. What happens in my life? What I remember? What reaches my heart? Or, and I start with that. And so, usually, family or personal experiences. As an example, the battleship, uh, the Dark Side of Dazzle, which is the largest piece to date, was used two tons of clay. It was a 24-foot long battleship, nine feet high, and it had sound and uh, a lot of different things that happened with it, and collecting stories from veterans of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And, and how do you listen to those stories? Uh, you, there's uh, seats that you uh, have uh, audio hookup, so you put earphones on, and also I have uh, the stories are written down in a book form so that you can read them also. So you can sit and just listen to the audio portion as you just look at the ship. So this is something more than just an art piece. It's actually a, a learning experience along with it. I think art is learning, you know, if you want to look at art in a broader sense. and. And it's about life. It's about uh, each artist has such a personal view of life, and, and they use that in their work. And I just have used my family, my father being in World War II. And so I started with that idea and then, and then went into the broader sense of what that meant. And dazzle is a particular kind of, w uh, of way that you're using the clay. Is that correct? Well, dazzle, when I was working on the piece, uh, I didn't know this, but a historian came into my studio and uh, looked at, I had a bathtub that had a four-foot ship in it, and he said, boy, that's dazzle. And I thought he meant, because the ship has a lot of different colors, 
I think we have a postcard of it of the ship or, or not with the not time. with you. Yeah. Okay, but it what what it was is there's bright colors. There's pinks and reds and greens and yellows, black and gray. And I thought he meant, oh, it's just very colorful, but it is dazzle camouflage. It was used during World War I, and because they didn't have sophisticated equipment during those days, the submarine would look up there and see a ship and then send the torpedo out. And with dazzle camouflage on the ships, that skewed the distance, the, the speed. Uh, they couldn't tell what was going on. So less, I think, than 1% of dazzle ships were uh, destroyed or, or damaged during the war because of the color, which is very bright. So he meant dazzle camouflage. So the, the name of the piece that I knew would be the dark side of dazzle. And it has the ship and then it has a bathroom that goes with it, a tub and sink and medicine cabinet and a figure. Steve Sheen. Marilyn, I, I think of large ceramic pieces and I might think of a bowl that's two <laughs> or three feet in diameter. We're talking about a battleship that's 24 <laughs> feet long. Yes. Does that create some special problems for you? It does. You have to figure out how, first thing I, I see where I'm going to work and how large the door is. <laughs> <laughs> because you have to move things in and out. And uh, so I, and also the, you fire, which means uh, you put the clay in a, a type of uh, heated environment, oven, it's called a kill in the, in the business. And you have to know how big you and, and how many you have in order to design the piece. So, so the that, ba that battleship was, is not a one piece? No, uh, it's not one piece. It, uh, when I've shown it, kids will always say, how many pieces are there? And I'll tell them to count them, but they've never totally counted them. But um, there's probably hundreds of pieces that fit together as a puzzle would, with an inner structure of wood and bolts and uh, cross beams to hold everything together. Is, is most of your work, uh, um, um, as opposed to something that, uh, ceramics a little harder than painting, you talk about abstract painting, I suppose that's easier to, uh, for, for people to relate to, but um, um, rather than just a piece with form that's, that's artistic but, but has no uh, real life counterpart, mm -hmm. is, is most of your work taken from real life objects, the battleship, uh, you mentioned the woman uh, uh, standing next to a sink, most of them are representations of real life objects or people? That's correct. It, it, they are. And I'll actually use myself as a model where uh, the woman in the bathtub, uh, the, there, she's in a, has a towel around her and she's a, in the bathroom. So I just used myself and we took a photo and then that photo then was uh, blown up to, um, by blown up I mean uh, you scale it to uh, I think it was 5'9 or 5'10 and then that's how I made that piece. And you mentioned with the battleship that it is very colorful. Mm -hmm. uh, are, the, are those colored portions of the, of the piece, are they glazed or are they just painted? They're glazed with a special technique that's called terra sigillata. And all that is, is what American Indian pottery is, is where you take colored clay and you paint it on the surface and then you burnish it. So that whole ship has colored clays painted on and then they're burnished and then when they're put in the fire they will, uh, white looks gray before it's fired and then when it's fired that gray turns to white. Uh, the purple will look, uh, uh, blue will look a little light purple. So you, you're not working with the colors that will eventually happen in most cases. I know that uh, Marilyn, the viewers are going to be pleased because you start talking about a battleship and we didn't have a picture and I can just hear them saying well why can't we see it? But the good news is, as I introduced the program, we do have uh, some uh, of your work, and we're going to ask them to bring it up on the screen now, the first okay. piece. And when they do, you'll be able to describe it for us. There we go. This is a piece that I did uh, in the early 90s, and it's uh, from the Last Immigrant series. And it began, again, with a personal idea, and it was my grandmother who um, was uh, immigrated to this country along with all four of the, my grandparents at the age of, I think, uh, 14 in the early 1900s, and she died at 99. So this was in memory of her and my other grandparents coming to this country. And basically it deals with the idea of coming to the last of something. So I used the bear to represent the natural uh, environment that we live in and what, what are we coming to the last with that, like the condors, last grizzlies, uh, clean lakes, clean air, all that. And um, it's, it's an eight foot, uh, in, this, in the photo, it's, that's the bronze bear that was made at the Walla Walla Foundry in Washington. 
and I did uh, I, an iron, eight foot iron bear in, at the Kohler Company. And there's some paintings in the middle uh, on bronze. And then there's a set of six bear heads in bronze, iron, and brass. And uh, those right now are at a, in Boise, Idaho, at the First Security Bank. And Boise bought that piece. And it's in a park down there. Uh, the whole set, they bought everything? They bought just the bear heads. Yes. When you were presenting to the students uh, at the symposium, I believe you indicated that well, some of your work is so large that someone may not want to purchase the entire works. And you, uh, I know you, for example, the table and all the food, mm -hmm. that you have even uh, allowed some pieces to disappear from the overall work and, and be sold. Is that correct? Oh, what I, no. What I do is the, the pieces that are on the table stayed with the table, but if someone wanted a hamburger okay. or a turkey or a pie or a cake, uh, I would make an addition. And that piece that you're talking about, Bad Manners, was sold. Someone did buy that, and I think you have a photo of that. Uh, but I believe. the first one, before mm -hmm. we leave the first one mm -hmm. that's gone off the screen, what was the name of the first one, the bear? The Last Immigrant. The Last Immigrant. Mm -hmm. So, uh, artist, uh, it's very important. There's, there's always a story behind even the title, and you've, you've certainly explained that from the mm -hmm. first one. We're going to ask our staff to put up the second one, which they have now. This one was, uh, this is a nice piece because this was a very early piece done in 1977, I believe, and it was when I was doing my master's degree at Washington State University. So this was one of the pieces that I did for that degree, and it's called Bed and Board, and it's about half life size, and it's, um, it was kind of a preliminary one to the Bad Manners piece, which uh, was done in 1984. So this was a the first piece that I did that using food, the arrangement of food in a different place where you would normally see food. Yes, uh, yes, you usually would see that. Of course, I guess there's a lot of people who lie in bed and watch TV and, and eat. And, and <laughs> eat and, 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 uh, that right. can explain something about uh, lack of physical uh, conditioning. A as you've done these very large pieces, I, I know some of them take longer than other ones and some are more challenging. But as time has passed and you've done this longer, uh, do, do they come um, easier for you to do, or is it uh, each piece is challenging in a different way? No, they're actually becoming harder to do. I find that you, you have to stay in really good physical uh, fit shape, and uh, if you don't, then you can get hurt. Uh, you, uh, it takes a lot of dedication and concentration to the, as example, the, the ship took a year, just the ship took a year to make. So I don't, you don't see it till 12 months later, and then it's up. So you have to have faith in that you're, you know, each day you go in and work, that eventually you'll get to see it. The table, Bad Manners, took, uh, I believe, 10 to 11 months to make that, that piece. And I think getting older, I just, it takes me a little longer to do the pieces because I do it all by myself. I don't have assistants that come in and, and help me. Uh, now we're going to see the third piece that we've brought for you to mm -hmm. show today. And this is Bad Manners. Uh, give us a little description about that. That's a, is, is that uh, in uh, normal this, size of a table? This is life size. The table is six feet long, and from uh, male figure to male figure, it's about ten and a half feet. The again, it took eleven months. The, there were a couple of collectors in Los Angeles that bought this, and they put it in their dining room. And they, uh, when they bought it, then I was able to donate about ten percent of the selling price to a a cause that would help uh, world hunger. It was the Hunger Project. And I just f feel sometimes art is nice to look at. And it does make you think it is part of life. But once you see it and think about it, it doesn't tend to do much beyond that. So I, with this piece and with others, I'd like to donate something to, to something. Uh, all I can think of is how can, one, how can the dining room be large enough for this and the regular table? Does, does anyone ever commission you and you go take a look at a, at a facility? about construction and size? Um, the, the Boise project with the bear heads, they existed, but I had to design the piece for the wall that it went on. So those six bear heads had fish, uh, brightly colored fish, swimming into it. So in that case, I did. But normally, I just make the pieces, and they exist. And if mm -hmm. they fit into someone's dining room, then great. Uh, someone right now is interested in buying that ship, which floored me. I, I mm -hmm. couldn't believe that that would ever be sold to a private home. But it may be too big for them, but they were interested in it. Yeah. So who knows? Janelle Burke. 
Well, we've talked a little bit about your work, but now we probably need to go back and find out something about your education and what you think is important um, to help that creativity that you have. What has been important to you over the years? Formal education and informal education. I think more the informal in some respects, and you can pick up informal in a formal setting. I, I feel that I came from a very small town in Sh from Sharon, Pennsylvania. My background isn't a, there isn't a big art museum or I wasn't seeing a lot of artists or art w when I grew up or even when I went to school. But I wanted to do art, I always knew I did, and I was just encouraged by the people that I came in contact with who were my teachers, were, were very encouraging and were always there to help you and they were never overbearing and I never picked up anything that was detrimental to that progress of thinking and, to, and also to the love of learning. And that's where the arts and the humanities wed, really, uh, isn't it? I, um, I agree with you. That's true. And, and so can you explain a little bit more about how then you went on and, and became formally educated? Um, I went to, uh, I worked, uh, at, at when I, my senior year in high school and even before that I, I worked and I sent myself through uh, undergraduate at Ohio Northern University and then I worked after that and saved money so that I could go to graduate school and I was accepted at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington and then Oh, along the line, you, you know, I went to a workshop uh, where it was a primitive ceramic workshop. I, I studied in Italy for a year. Uh, I um, worked with a, a people, my high school art teacher and her husband, uh, Chicken Nitsa Mangus, in uh, Pennsylvania, and they allowed me to 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 be there and to to work and uh, just to have fun and learn how to cook and things like that. Steve Shink. I'd like to explore a little bit more of this concept of, of, of the sort of the serial nature you talk about, or Tony did maybe in his introduction, that most of, most of your artwork has been produced as part of a series. Uh, could you explain that to us just a little bit? Uh, yes. The, f after graduate school, uh, the first piece that I did was a piece about my mom. She was a sergeant in the Marines. Mm -hmm. And with that, major, that was a major piece. It was uh, about 12 feet long, 4 feet wide and it, were, it had 11 lady marines in it. And then there were two smaller pieces that all related to that same subject. Then after that came a series with it, I was, being, I was going to be married. So I did a series about that and it had uh, the alligator's wife, which is a 15 foot long alligator with a bride lying on top of the alligator. And then there was a life-size piece of three brides having a cake eating contest called the fourth sister. So by series, it means that in 1982 when those were shown that was the bride series and then came bad manners and then came the ship and then after that was the last immigrant with the bears and the metal work that I did so the series tend to, to deal with an idea and there's a number of pieces that are in the series that that work with that idea well, now I'm going to ask a, a dangerous question here, given the fact that your husband might just see the show. Yes. But you did say earlier that, that a lot of the, the inspiration from your work came from real life mm -hmm. events, and I can certainly see that as someone about to be married. The, the, the bridal piece makes some sense to me, except for the alligator. <laughs> for the alligator. Where, where, did the, where did the alligator's bride come from? Well, it's a very interesting story. Uh, my father sent my mother a postcard uh, when, before they were married, and I think it was the, before he went into World War II and what it was. I remember this as a child. It was so impressive to me to see this postcard. He and another man were holding on to an alligator. And when I saw that, I thought, well, my dad is the bravest, bravest person in the world. But it was a stuffed alligator. And, and, and to this date, I've seen a lot of different photos of people with that same alligator. But that was the initial idea for that piece. And then getting married, I thought, well, there's a lot of things you have to think about. The changes, that's a big transition in someone's life. It means that you're sharing your life with someone else, and will it work, will it not? Will you grow, will you not grow? And so the, that's what that piece was about. And so the alligator, everyone asked, uh, Ross, my husband, who is also an artist, always says that he's the alligator, but I've had men that looked at the piece and felt they were the bride and <laughs> the wife <laughs> was the alligator. So, it, you know, it's just, I think the alligator becomes the unknown factor. That may be part of the appeal in all artwork, I suppose. That's true. Um, it would seem to me that it, it is a um, an act of some bravery 
to embark on a project as a professional artist to embark on a single project that's going to take a year of your time not knowing whether there's a, a buyer out there somewhere uh, who's, who's going to want to acquire that piece. How, how do you get yourself ready for that mentally? I uh, think about it for a few years before I actually do a piece. Right now I'm thinking about after I do the piece I'm working on now, I'm already thinking about that next piece and priming myself. When I w wanted to do the ship, I would tell people, I'm going to do a 24-foot battleship, and my husband would say, don't say that. You may not do it. And I, I know that I'll do it. Uh, but it, it is scary at times, and when I finish them, they're out of sight, out of mind. I don't dwell on them. I don't think about them. I'm on to the next piece, and maybe that my energy then is concentrated for that time and then when it's done, I don't think about it. it go, I go on to the next piece. In fact, I look at them and wonder, who did that? Like, did I really do that? Uh, is, it, it, is it fair to say that it, that it is the art and, and the theme that, that uh, appeals to you, that drives your work, and, and not commercial prospects for it? A yes, a absolutely. And I, for the first time uh, ever, I did a Christmas sale this year. And um, I, since I hadn't ever done that, I took orders, like when I was a Girl Scout, sold Girl Scout cookies, and it was quite interesting. I took orders, and I sold work, and I'm able now to use that uh, to go to China in August and to, um, to do some other projects. And, but that was the first time I really commercially thought about art and selling it. I, there's a gallery in Sun Valley, Dennis Ochi Fine Arts, that shows my work, and they were very successful. I just, just had a show uh, last month, and they did quite well. And so there are buyers out there, even for a 24-foot battleship. And uh, it's just finding that buyer. And so I, right now, I don't worry about it. But I do the smaller pieces, the, the additions. And all the, all the work that I've done has had smaller pieces that go with that, that, that have sold. And then that helps pay the bills and your electricity bill, clay bill, mm -hmm. uh, and all that. Mel, I have to do this because we've <laughs> been having part of our theme this week. People in the humanities, writers and artists, visual, fine arts, all, all the areas of art, uh, obviously they're very creative, and as Steve was alluding to that, uh, but the idea has to come from somewhere. Uh, do, are you just sitting quietly and, and, and you get an image or idea? How do you work on creating the idea that you're going to do a battleship? I, I know you told a little bit about that already, but mm -hmm. some of, you said it's from your life experiences, but you have so many experiences. How do you uh, wind up choosing a particular piece? That's a really good question, and I think it's probably different for everyone. And I'll, I can tell you how the ideas come to me is I'm, I'm just very observant I, to sound, to smell, to images. I can be watching TV, and I'll see a, just a painting on the wall or a poster on the wall, and it will say, the dark's the dark. And then that gives me the title, The Dark Side of Dazzle, or something like that. Um, Things that I have in my home, we have quite a large art collection, and so I'm surrounded by art and uh, stories. Movies are, when I watch movies, I, I find great um, inspiration from, from that medium. And something will just go into my brain, and then it comes out differently somehow. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I can't tell you when it happens. Does you visualize it then, do you? As well, it, it, this piece I'm working on now, I knew pretty much what the idea was. There, there's 2,000 dinosaur bones. There'll be two figures walking through the bones, and there'll be a large mural uh, behind it of birds, different types of birds. And that took me a really long time. It seems very simple, but it, it took a long time to get the formal arrangement of those, of, of those concepts, of those ideas. And... Um, I, it's magic sometimes to me because all of a sudden I'll be either waking up or before I go to sleep or if I'm sitting and relaxing and it's usually that then if I'm, when I'm relaxing that a thought will come into my mind that I pay attention to and that idea then I'll know if it's a good one or, or not and I'll tell my husband like what do you think of this and he'll go very good idea but think about it so then you think about it and you think about it and it grows it changes and eventually you'll have the dark side of Dazzle, or you'll have a piece like Bad Manners. But do I hear you saying that you, know, you, you have obviously a lot of ideas, and, mm -hmm. and some of them just, just grip you, or, they, or they, they, you know, you're almost uh, 
possessed with it. You've got to do that. And others that you may let go of the wayside and not do it. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't do all the, those no, that you start out with an idea. I, when I, because it takes so long and so much energy goes into making a piece, I think a long time about is it worth my time and my energy and my dedication to, to, to stay in that studio for a year, for two years mm -hmm. to do a piece. And if it, if it comes out, yes, that it is worth it. And, um, you know, the dark side of Dazzle, that was very important. It was about not only my father, but it was about a daughter's interpretation of what happens to, you know, a father that has gone to war. What experiences did they have? Uh, you know, it could be a brother. Um, it could be people that were in a war that, who, you know, had these experiences. So that was important to me, and I have then the energy and the time than I can put into doing it and to completing it. So there's really a lot of detail and a lot of history within that piece. Mm -hmm. Do you work only on one piece at a time or do you uh, sometimes do more than one I can at the same period of time? Yes, I can only work on one at a time, but sometimes oh, uh, someone will call up and say, we need a chocolate cake. And so I can stop and I, I can make, make a cake. But uh, when I, uh, in about a month, I will begin this, this, like, we'll continue this next piece, and I will not be probably be di let myself be disturbed too drastically in order to complete that within another year, I think. Janelle Burke. Just for clarification, I think what you're saying is then that you do um, one large piece at a time. Yes. A but you are doing simultaneously some smaller pieces that may be for sale. Now in my career, but earlier, I would only work on one piece at a time. When that piece was done, then I would do the smaller pieces. But now I can I can go back and forth. But I found you get very busy, and so you have to make a priority what's important. And if it means you have to plant your garden, you know that you have to do that in down in Moscow, Idaho, you know by like end of May, you know sometime in May. So that's a priority if I want a garden, and then you know then. I, I tend to, if I can keep it simple and if I can keep my life in that type of priority, then I can do it all. I know we're going to run out of time very quickly, but one of the questions that I want to ask you are, is, are conditions better for artists today than they were when you started your career? I have no idea. I don't know how to answer that. I think for some artists, yes. For others, no. It, it's just, it's a, it's a complicated business and it's not easy to get into the art business and sell and to be successfully successful commercially, but you can be successful as an artist from the, just the work that you do, but maybe not commercially. Marilyn, on that note, I have to bring the program to conclusion. On behalf of uh, Steve and Janelle and our staff, we thank you not only for being on this program, but uh, your lecture to the student body and the workshop that you're doing. You've been most generous of your time. We congratulate you with this extraordinary work that you're doing, and good luck in the future. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest has been Marilyn Lashier, who is a, a really gifted artist. I know that you can see that from the work, and thank you for being with us today. We'd like to invite you to be with us again next week at this same time when we will discuss uh, what we believe to be an important issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony.